Hello and welcome everyone to our third and final roundtable discussion as part of this 2022 COFAS Country Risk Conference. On behalf of the whole team here at BFM Business, it is our, our pleasure to be once again partnering with this event. Uh, our discussion today will focus on the world economic outlook and we'll uh, conclude this 2022 uh, edition. So far, we've had uh, very enlightening discussions first dealing with uh, increasing uh, divergence in world economies and uh, its ensuing consequences. And we've also been discussing uh, transition, being uh, meaning, of course, uh, transitions toward, towards more sustainable development models. Uh, but I know everybody watching us today is very much looking forward to uh, uh, listening to our COFAS experts uh, telling us what to expect uh, as far as the world economic outlook is concerned and more specifically whether uh, risks that uh, will be outlined today are uh, possibly uh, threatening the world economic uh, recovery. So let's get, let's get right down to it. Uh, with me today to discuss this issue is uh, Jean-Christophe Café. Bonjour. Hello. You are the chief economist for COFAS. Ankadan, thank you very much for joining us Hello. today. You're the group underwriting uh, director for COFAS. Uh, Bruno, Bruno Fernandez, you are uh, the head of macro research at COFAS. Ruben, Ruben Nizar, you are the economist for uh, North America. And we'll also have... Uh, not with me in the studio here today, but joining us on the line, uh, three additional experts. Uh, Bernard Orr, it's uh, quite late in your part of the world. Bernard, you're joining us from uh, Singapore today. Uh, thanks very much and uh, welcome to our panel discussion. Uh, we are joined also with uh, by Christian von Berg, who's joining us from Mainz. She's the economist for Northern Europe. And uh, Patricia Krauss is the economist from uh, Latin America. And she's joining us from... Uh, Sao Paulo in Brazil. I was actually watching the weather forecast today and it's 21 degrees and sunny in Sao Paulo today. So it'll be easier maybe next year if we're all in Brazil uh, to have this Great. discussion. That's my su suggestion before we start uh, getting into this discussion. So let's get to it, uh, Jean-Christophe. What are basically your three takeaways for this 2022 World Economic Outlook? To, to put things in, into perspective, I would just remind that after collapsing in 2020, which saw the largest recession on record since World War II, the world economy bounced back very sharply last year, with the global GDP increasing by 5.5%, which basically is the best figure recorded since the first oil shock 50 years ago. So what we expect for 2022, basically, is a kind of landing of the global economy. I mean, we expect the economic recovery to, to continue, but albeit slowing down progressively and substantially. And this recovery will remain an event, and it is subject to huge uncertainties. Okay, so point number one is we are recovering. Uh, we are getting in a sort of more normal functioning of the world economy. Is that, is that a fair summary? Yeah, indeed. We could have talked about normalization mm -hmm. instead of lending, as we have all gone through a period of two years of abnormality, I would say, in all respects. But talking about normalization would have required beforehand to precisely define define what normality now stands for. Mm -hmm. I mean, are we back to, to pre-pandemic trends or is there any new normal, as we economists are used to ask ourselves after such a crisis? And, and what new normal, if any? What is the world after, uh, actually? We have seen increasing, uh, in widening inequalities since the beginning of the crisis, and we also have seen the outcome of the COP26. Mm -hmm. So put it differently, uh, we are very far from the, 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 the more inclusive and the greener recovery it was supposed to be. So when it comes to macro, what is now the normal level of interest rates? What has become potential growth, GDP growth at the global level? Is it higher because of higher productivity gains, for instance, linked to higher digitalization, or is it lower because of capacity <coughs> destructions or because least productive firms have survived thanks to government's large-scale risk plan? Those questions remain in my opinion, open questions. I mean, for the time being, completely unanswered. So it's, so, a, it's, a, it's a very complex uh, recovery. There's many aspects. Rick, you were alluding to them, inflation, interest rates, for example, indeed. monetary policy, which we'll be uh, discussing a little bit later on. Uh, your second point was uh, about how uneven uh, this recovery is as well. Yeah, indeed. Behind the aggregate figure of 4% GDP growth we forecast for this year, we have wide dispersion across countries, as it has been the case in 2021. On one side, we have countries which have basically weathered the storm 
very well at the cost of a colossal increase in their indebtedness, and then thanks to the rapid diffusion of vaccines. And on the other side, we have countries which have been hardly hit and we are which are still mired into recession or struggling to get out of it because they did not and they still do not have monetary or fiscal leeway or access to vaccination. In those countries which are basically emerging, especially low-income countries, scars are deep and vaccination rates at the end of 2021 remain very low. Mm -hmm. So such differences in the vaccination rates across the globe explain why the overall pattern we have had last year should continue mm -hmm. in 2022 with basically advanced economies outperforming emerging markets for the second year in a row. Mm -hmm. So complex, diverging, uh, which makes obviously for a, a number of uncertainties. And there are many uncertainties and everybody uh, ov obviously has one specifically in mind, which is uh, supply, chain, supply chain issues. Indeed, this is the main macro risk we all have in mind, but it is not the only one. Mm -hmm. uh, because the crisis we have been experiencing for, for two years now is a multidimensional crisis. It has been and it is still a health and an economic crisis, but it is now coupled with an energy crisis, which comes along a global leadership crisis and a rise in geopolitical tensions. There is also a rising risk of a, a political crisis after such two years. And this risk, this political risk is still increasing because the current inflation surge we have, especially when it affects basic needs, is mm -hmm. fueling social discontent. Mm -hmm. This is typically what our in-house mm -hmm. uh, political and social fragility index shows. Mm. I mean, mm. political risk, I mean, political upheaval and social unrest has never been so high, mm -hmm. uh, both in advanced and in emerging economies. So when it comes to macro, indeed, supply chain developments, I would say it's the mother of all risks mm. because it affects inflation prospects and also because it affects GDP prospects. So mm. if, for instance, uh, we had Omicron or a new variant eating severely China, its zero COVID policy would strongly jeopardize, I would say, our quite consensual underlying assumptions of a progressive easing of supply chains. This would push downwards our GDP forecast mm. while inf pushing inflation higher. So this is quite a long and impressive list of threats potentially to, to, to the world economy. Let me add one more, uh, Ukraine and the tensions uh, between Russia and the rest of Europe. How does that impact your scenario and how are you able to take that into account bearing in mind that nobody knows what's going to happen. There could be war tomorrow or there could be an agreement tomorrow. Exactly. In my opinion, it's far too early to say. Uh, we do not know what would be the nature of Russia intervention if it eventually intervened, I mean, militarily speaking. We do not know what could be the retaliation measures that Western countries would choose to adopt. And we even don't know how Russia would retaliate mm -hmm. to those retaliation measures. So who knows, as you said, we all have in mind natural gas supply, uh, but in my opinion, it won't be in Russia's interest to cut natural gas supply to its major clients. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind that 80% of gas exports from Russia are mm -hmm. flowing through Europe. Mm -hmm. So there are too many unknowns, too many combinations to have even a rough idea of what could be the global macro impact of the worsening of the situation there. Anka, uh, we're just saying with, uh, with Jean-Christophe that uh, probably supply chain issues were the, mothers, the mother of all uncertainties. Um, what is your general assessment and uh, what should we look to uh, uh, as signs that things are getting worse or that they are getting better? Indeed, Thierry. Uh, I think uh, when we look at the supply chain constraints, we have to, to see it from the perspective of the increasing demand in the last 12 months. And this... Uh, huge, huge level of demand has uh, uh, revealed a lot of weaknesses on the glo global supply chain. Uh, but we have also to keep in mind that uh, um, uh, the corporates are coming after 20, 30 years of investment and a lot of effort to reach the so-called just-in-time supply chain, you know. Mm -hmm. So this, this means nothing else but optimization of inventory, very little flexibility when the supply is not there. So uh, we see that this puts a lot of pressure on the companies and on their business models because they cannot satisfy this increasing demand. And the particularity of this crisis is the fact that 
um, we observe bottlenecks on all links of the supply chain. Mm -hmm. We don't discuss only about uh, inputs that are missing semiconductors or uh, chips, but also labor shortages. There are not enough containers, uh, not enough trucks, not enough truck drivers. So a lot, a lot of problems that are escalating in different geographies for mm -hmm. different structural reasons. But the consensus seems to be that things might improve uh, in the second half of the year. Would you agree with that? Indeed, uh, we, uh, the recent data show that the inventory levels seem to, to be uh, more, um, let's say, sufficient now. So the pressure is easing now. However, the uh, logistic bottlenecks are still persisting. Our estimation is that indeed towards the second half of the year, we will see an easing of the current situation. Mm. But certain aspects will remain valid also in 2023 with regards to a uh, lack of some items on the supply chain. Mm. And we have to, to keep in mind that this is linked, of course, um, with a demand that we consider will moderate in the next period. So uh, this will help to ease a bit the supply uh, pressure. On the other hand, the risks are there because, uh, as already mentioned by Jean-Christophe, uh, the zero policy in some countries of Asia will continue to put a lot of pressure on the supply chain. And in the same time, uh, even if companies have put a lot of effort into increasing and adjusting capacity, mm -hmm. this cannot be reached at uh, even level on all types of, uh, of goods. So I think uh, we will have to, to wait and observe on certain areas how okay. the situation will evolve. Okay. Obviously, Jean-Christophe, one of the consequences of uh, these supply chain issues is inflation because uh, it's, it's difficult to mean demand, so prices are spiking. Uh, there are many inflation pressures, including, obviously, uh, energy prices. What's mm -hmm. the outlook on that? I think it's really important to distinguish between the short and the long term when it comes to energy prices. In the long term, energy prices are for sure inflationary because of energy transition, and all the huge event investment it requires. Also because of the investment gap in oil and gas, where upstream capital expenditures have been slashed in 2015 and have barely recovered because, b before falling back in 2020. But when it comes to the, to the short term, I mean in the coming quarters, we see the current trend of increasing energy prices to reverse soon. I know it's, it might be hard to mm -hmm. believe, mm -hmm. given the current market trends, mm -hmm. especially when it comes to oil, whose prices have been steadily increasing since the beginning of the year. But when you look at the, at the oil balance, which is very tight now, it should loosen somewhat in the coming months, thanks to the ramp up of supply in some countries, such as Brazil, such as Canada, such as Guyana. And also because op the OPEC Plus coalition has clearly stated that it will keep on adding barriers to the market. Mm -hmm. uh, some things they've reiterated at their latest meeting a, a, few, a few days ago. It would be also very surprising, in my view, if the U.S. shale oil production did not accelerate in the short term, given that okay. break-even prices, especially mm. in the Permian, in sweet mm. spots in the Permian, are half the current level of WTI, which mm. is the U.S. Mm. benchmark uh, spot prices now. So we expect the oil balance to loosen somewhat okay. with the coming slowdown also okay. of demand. When it comes to natural gas, we also expect some kind of easing after the heating season in the Northern Hemisphere, mm. especially in Europe where the risk premium uh, of linked to current geopolitical tensions over Ukraine should narrow mm. if and only if for sure there is no further escalation uh, in tensions uh, in, between, with Russia, mm. which is the assumption we have made mm. even once again. It's nobody's interest to see things worsening there. Okay. So all in all, we do not expect, once again, energy prices to be deflationary, mm. neither in the short or in the long term, but we expect them to drive headline inflation figures down in the coming months. Yet, if things improve on the energy front, uh, inflation will still remain an issue, and as a result, monetary policy will have to adapt. And I think we all agree here that one of the features of, uh, of this 2022 year will be uh, that interest rates all over the world are going to start uh, rising again, specifically uh, in the US, Ruben. What do you expect the, uh, the outlook to be there? Uh, what should we expect from the Fed? It has made pretty clear what uh, its uh, intentions are for, for the months to come. Yeah, so in the US, inflation is already at multi-decade high. Um, the headline consumer price index rose by 7% year on year in December, mm -hmm. um, the highest since June 1982. Um, so inflation is here. And now the big question is, will it stay with us in 2022? 
We believe that it will remain elevated throughout the year. And by elevated, we mean that it will remain above the 2% target of the Federal Reserve throughout 2022. But at the same time, we also expect that this headline figure will ease somewhat in the coming month and quarters. So Jean-Christophe mentioned the uh, easing pressures from, from energy prices. Um, we also think that most and a lot of the pressures that we see in the inflation reports are linked to ext the extraordinary circumstances of the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. And as things land, as some of them will normalize a little bit, including um, the shift in consumptions that we've seen in America, and especially um, the shift from services to, uh, to goods, which was very inflationary in 2021. And with consumption shifting back to services in 2022, it will help to bring inflation down. Mm -hmm. But with that being said, there are very high upside risks um, of course, all these uncertainties that we've mentioned uh, in the first part of this roundtable um, are inflationary. And I would add that we also we are also looking at the evolution of wage growth. And with labor shortages that Enka mentioned, mm -hmm. we are seeing uh, pressures on wages. And this wage increase might feed into future inflation, which would entrench the inflation further. Mm -hmm. Turning into the Fed, what will happen? Of course, the Fed has to turn more aggressive to respond to these upside risks and to these high inflation. So they mentioned during uh, their latest forecast that they, they, they would raise interest rates three times mm -hmm. by 25 basing mm -hmm. points this year. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems a little bit um, optimistic at this mm -hmm. stage, um, but I don't think that, um, that it matters that much because the U.S. economy and the recovery in the U.S. has been strong. And I think that in the U.S., um, they can absorb higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even if the Federal Reserve mm -hmm. increased interest rates very aggressively this year, they can weather the storm and still land. But that's a very narrow line to walk on mm -hmm. because on the one hand, you have the risk of inflation running hot permanently. And on the other hand, you have the risk of being too aggressive with your monetary policy, chalking uh, economic activity as a result. What do you have? Do you have? Um, what is your assessment of what's going on in 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 uh, in, in, in the continental America as all well and in Latin America, Jean Christophe? The, the Fed tightening cycle is mm. obviously bad news for emerging economies, especially those who have huge current account deficit. I mean, external financing needs, mm. and some countries in South uh, in, in Latin America are obviously will obviously have to tighten their monetary policy to, to respond and to avoid any, any depreciation in their foreign exchange currency, in their uh, in foreign exchange. So indeed, this is one of the main risks we have identified for this year. I mean, risk li linked to the monetary tightening, which is underway in the US, but not only. Okay, let's try, let's try this again and maybe uh, try and see whether Bernard or in Singapore can uh, hear us and uh, share this conversation with us. Bernard, uh, obviously in Asia, the picture is uh, slightly different, at least so far. Uh, inflation uh, is under control, obviously, to, to ver varying degrees, depending on, on which country we're looking at. But overall, the, infl the inflation picture is more reassuring in your part of the world, isn't it? Uh, yes, indeed. So inflation dynamics are, are quite different in Asia. Uh, compared to the rest of the world. So to be sure, there are accumulating inflation pressures, but the rate of increase is noticeably you know, more gentle compared to the rest of the world. And I think this is because of a few factors. Um, first, we have a, a much lower inflation in food and energy. Uh, second, you know, Asia also experienced a slower increase in transport fees uh, compared to you know, other transport fees going to further parts of the world like the Western economy. And they also have a greater availability of alternative suppliers. And finally, the third point is that demand recovery in Asia is not as strong as seen in the Western advanced economies. So of course, there is also some diversity in terms of uh, uh, the inflation across the region. So for example, India and Philippines, uh, their inflation are on the high side, but not unusual compared to previous trends in these countries. China and Korea inflation uh, look to have reached its peak. Um, 
At the same time, Thailand and Indonesia reported rising inflation, but this the, the headline numbers are still within the targets of the central banks. In, in the case of Singapore, where, where I'm based, inflation is much stronger compared to previous trends, and that is why uh, the central bank uh, is getting quite concerned and they decided to tighten monetary policy uh, last month in an unscheduled meeting. But overall, like you mentioned, inflation in Asia uh, is really more gentle, much more benign, and they are largely driven by supply issues and uh, higher input costs, okay. uh, while demand factors are largely absent. Thank you. Thank you, Bernard. Let's try again to go see Patricia in uh, Brazil, in Sao Paulo, and uh, discuss the inflation outlook for Latin America. Patricia, what's going on in your part of the world? Well, in Latin America last year, all major economies with inflation target regimes, so the case of Brazil, Mexico, Chile, Colombia, and Peru, they ended the year with their inflation above the tolerance range of their central bank. And this was particularly the case of Brazil, where inflation ended above 10 percent, the highest in five years, due to the, the severe impact of a drought, which increased the cost of electricity generation. Uh, overall, uh, really the inflation in Latin America is not only related with more volatile volatile items such as food and energy prices, but even when you look to core inflation, it's also observed a strong increase last year, notably in Brazil, Chile, and Mexico. So for this year, overall, we expect inflation to lose some momentum in the second half of this year, but it'll still remain above the tolerance range of the central bank and should only converge towards the target uh, next year. And this expected deceleration in inflation is notably due to the lagged impact of the current retightening of monetary cycle taking place in Latin America, and as activity should lose momentum. I would say that overall the risks uh, for inflation this year, uh, they are tilted to the upside and that they are not only related to the evolution of commodity prices like everywhere and uh, how long it takes uh, for supply chain disruption to, to fix, but I will also mention a higher inflationary inertia and exchange rate. And then when I talk about exchange rate, I mean two points. One is related to the Federal Reserve. So if the Federal, Reserve, the Federal Reserves become more hawkish, of course, this has negative spillover effects for uh, emerging economies, and this includes Latin America, and also because of a heavy political calendar that's looming in Latin America this year. So this includes presidential elections in Brazil now in October, in Colombia in March, a new government to sworn in in Chile in March that comes together for the constitution rewrite, and that's also uh, the a source of uncertainty and expected to get momentum this year. So overall, uh, this could impact exchange rate, and this means as well that central banks in Latin America, they will continue to retighten their monetary policy uh, this year. Okay. Thank you, Patricia. It's quite interesting going into these various parts of the world because we can see some common threads emerging. Uh, very uncertain world, so very hard to predict how prices are going to evolve. Uh, we might be able to keep inflation under control, but in pretty much every case is going to be above the targets of the central banks and interest rates uh, will have to rise. Uh, Bruno, would that say that those rules will apply to the Eurozone and the ECB as well? Well, actually, in the Eurozone, it's true, uh, inflationary pressures are also mounting uh, almost everywhere. But we have to, to, to say that so far, for the moment, they are still somewhat a bit um, uneven. Um, for instance, while in France, inflation is still rather moderated, around 3%. Um, Prices have been soaring in, in Spain, uh, where inflation is even higher than, than in Germany, uh, around 5 or 6% in both countries. Um, these discrepancies are exclusively attributable to energy prices um, because core inflation is basically um, very similar in both countries, around 2%, slightly above 2%. Um, energy prices are very volatile, for instance, in, in Spain, because 40% of consumers have contracts with prices changes every day following uh, the wholesale market prices. Uh, on the other end, for instance, in some countries like France or Portugal, um, the electricity prices are reviewed once or twice per year, mm -hmm. only with governments trying to limit the impact on consumers. Um, and maybe on factors that could um, make inflation more long-lasting, let's say, uh, we see that manufactured good prices are increasing as higher costs are passed on consumers. But so far, we don't see any second-round effects on wages. Um, for instance, in, in Spain, 
um, the average increase in salaries agreed in collective bargaining was around 1.5% in 2021. Um, and even in the very last negotiations of the year, in the last quarter, uh, the average increase was also 1.5%, well below um, inflation figures in, in, in Spain. And maybe few words um, also in, in the UK, because I think it's quite interesting. Um, the situation there is a bit different than in the Eurozone, but at the end, um, the inflation is very high and broad-based, let's say. So that's why the Bank of England was the first major central bank um, to raise interest rates in December 2021. Uh, and it is expected to continue raising interest rates um, with three additional hikes being expected this year. Thank you, Bruno. Let's try and uh, go see Christian now, Christian uh, von Bergen in, uh, in Frankfurt. Uh, it's very unusual, Christian, Christian, isn't it, to be able to put inflation and Germany in the same sentence. We, we, we're not used to doing that. It feels almost uh, unnatural. Yet it was completely justified in uh, 2021. Will that also be the case this year? Well, unfortunately, yes. Um, what we can say for Germany is that we, of course, cannot keep up with the spectacular numbers from uh, the US or Latin America. But for us, we have right now an inflation rate of 4.9 percent without any special effects. This is one of the highest levels in around 30 years. So right after the reunification, we had similar numbers. And uh, of course, this is a big concern for us because, uh, well, at the moment, it looks like that mainly higher energy and food prices are the main reason for this increase. But when we are looking at the producer prices, the yearly rate of producer prices is as high as 1949. So wow. since the beginning okay. of the statistic, that was the time when Germany, well, the Federal Republic of Germany was founded. Mm. So uh, you can imagine how it is to be right now in Germany. Um, we see that more and more producers already said that uh, they will forward this price pressure more to consumers. So there is more inflation in the pipeline. And this triggers the Germans. The Germans are very sensitive from historic perspective and experience on inflation. And uh, this is the reason why right now here every alarm bell is ringing. Including uh, wage pressure, which was uh, uh, which is a topic that uh, we've alluded to here in many parts of the world. Prices are rising. Companies of overall are doing pretty well. Um, so, I mean, the wage pressure is, is, is increasing. Is that also the case in Germany? Yes, we see first signs. So we see first unions who are increasing um, their negotiation wage. But we also see it in the minimum uh, wage, which could be increased in October uh, by around 20% to 12 euros per hour. And um, this is why we see that um, this inflation dynamic is maybe a little bit uh, longer lasting than in other regions. Uh, Christian, you're also keeping an eye on, on what the ECB is up to. And uh, what do you expect on that front? And by that, I mean, it's pretty clear that rates are going to rise. Uh, that intention has been made pretty clear. But uh, Christine Lagarde is also saying that she wants to try and do as much as she can to protect economic recovery in the Eurozone. So how do you go about doing those two things at the same time? Well, first of all, was the ECB really that much clear on the interest rate hike? Uh, I mean, what has the ECB done is um, the ECB itself did not do any communication really on uh, the interest rate. The only thing that... Christine Lagarde did was she did not confirm anymore the sentence that an interest rate would be very unlikely. And I mean, between us, I would have done the same. <laughs> if uh, I have this high inflation, I would have not repeated the sentence anymore. Um, I think or we think from COFAS that uh, first of all, the ECB will concentrate on the end of the PEP, the Pandemic Emergency Purchasing Program. Mm -hmm. This will end at the end of March. And um, to have not just like a gap um, of the balance sheet, there will be some increase in the normal asset purchase program, which still keeps on. And it will actually increase by 20 billion euros per month to a total of 40 billion at the beginning. So in the second quarter of 2020, and then slowly will be, will be reduced. So this means the balance sheet will be smoothed at um, <clears throat> at the current outlook. 
and um, and then then maybe there will be an, a hike in the interest rate and the key interest rate but if then more into the direction of december and when you look at our inflation forecast we think that at that moment already we see good signs of um, dissolvement of supply chain issues, that the pressure on inflation has been reduced at that moment. So there is not so much pressure on the ECB to react on that front. Okay. However, I mean, uh, you said it already, there is, of course, a very big balance, or you have to keep the balance between two big risks. On the one side, we have especially southern European countries, where already the rumors of an interest rate hike have uh, increased their yields on government bonds. And of course, the ECB has to be cautious there to not increase these yields further and to make financial um, the position of the financial position of the country mm -hmm. harder. Mm -hmm. But on the other side, as I am a German from the German perspective, this is a time of a lot of patience and self-discipline because we are quite frustrated with the situation, low interest rates, high inflation, this is a mm. no-go for us. So um, the ECB has to um, balance out both of these risks. And yes. this is a really tough pre job. Pre pre precisely, jean Christophe. Do you, do you expect some tension to arise within the eurozone because presumably uh you know from what listening to what christian is saying it's it's pretty obvious that uh you know germany is going to put pressure on the ecb to to get the rates yeah. to rise in a not too distant future whereas other countries might be a, a, of a quite different opinion this is the problem since mm -hmm. the beginning in, in the euro area i mean there is no one size fits all mm -hmm. and th this is a risk we have also identified for 2022 i mean a policy misstep which is basically on the monetary side uh, mm -hmm. for 2022. I mean, a, a fear-driven monetary policy response, especially from the ECB, could trigger another kind of crisis mm -hmm. in this multi-dimensional multi crisis I was talking about a few minutes ago that we haven't had yet. I mean, a fresh financial crisis, given the current level of indebtedness as, and uh, record high uh, asset price valuations from stocks to housing. So this is a risk that we will clearly monitor very closely for 2022. Bruno? No, no, definitely. I mean, we saw that it, it had definitely an impact on the Italian bond yield in the mm -hmm. Greek bond yield too. So definitely, um, as Christian mentioned, the ECB has to find the right balance between uh, curbing inflation and at the same time being careful on the, the depth of uh, all the most indebted countries and the yield and to make it sustainable. Anka, how should companies assess this uh, uncertain and difficult environment, one in which rates uh, all over the world are very uh, uh, likely to rise. Many of your clients have uh, operations uh, in many various continents. So is that how, how, to what extent is that going to, going to make their life more difficult, uh, getting financing, for example, more difficult? How should they prepare for that new environment? Indeed, uh, this environment uh, will become extremely challenging for a lot of corporates, especially for SMEs, because usually when the interest rates go up, this means sooner or later, uh, later a higher financing cost for, for the companies. It will highly depend, of course, on the uh, type of the facility needed and on their um, um, need for, for financing and the source of financing. But um, we think that the most exposed companies to, to such phenomenon are those companies that are actually uh, as, that have as business model the project-based companies, like the ones that are acting in construction sector. And I have to remark that that the, probably here we see a, a very high risk due to the fact that the construction <coughs> sector is already uh, threatened by the increase of material and input costs the pressure on, on the wages as the labor market is becoming very hot in many geographies. And therefore, um, uh, I think the ability of such companies will depend on how uh, fast and how easy they can transfer this higher cost to the end user. Mm. Uh, what we have to keep in mind is that higher financing costs means usually uh, more difficult access to, to financing. And this means that the growth uh, f uh, will not be felt so easily in the next uh, period, which could put us in a, a vicious circle, as we will see probably a lower investment sentiment and uh, lower demand as well. Okay. Uh, Bernard, Bernard O oh in Singapore, as uh, Anka was talking about uh, construction as being a quite a vulnerable sector, I was thinking about 
China. Obviously, uh, construction in China has been, a, has been a big issue and a big concern uh, over the past few months. What is the outlook specifically for that sector in that particular country today? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, one of the major growth risks uh, that we see for China this year is, is clearly the property market downturn, which is uh, closely linked to the construction sector. And, you know, real estate related activities account for nearly 30 percent of China's GDP. And when you add the property market downturn to several other negative forces that are acting on China's growth, such as their zero COVID uh, policy, the weak consumption that they have, uh, and ex moderating export growth and possibly also decarbonization uh, policy, there is a non-negligible risk of a hard landing in China. So we expect uh, the GDP to slow from 8.1% last year to 5.4% uh, this year. And there is also uh, quite a multitude of downside risks to this forecast with the possibility of it going below 5%. Is there anything the Chinese government can do that it has not done already in order to manage this crisis and to try and avoid uh, disaster if, 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 if this is indeed what, what, it, what is the threat? Uh, yes, in, indeed. So for, for China, the authorities have stressed on achieving uh, stability uh, in 2022, So, which, by the way, is a year of uh, great political significance for, for, for China because they will have their... Uh, uh, twice in a decade uh, party congress where they will select the top leadership at the end of this year. So they have, in fact, made some policy changes uh, re recently, such as uh, they have eased up on some of the property-related lending. They have also loosened housing purchase curbs, restrictions, and, and also uh, eased some of that down payment ratios. So on top of all this, policy rates have also been reduced, uh, such as the uh, bank's reserve requirement ratio, the benchmark interest rate, and so on. So the fiscal and bond trip uh, tightening that we saw last year is effectively over this year. But this does not mean that we are going to see, you know, big bank policy support this year. What is important to the Chinese is what they call the cross-cycle adjustments, which simply means that they want to make sure that any near-term macroeconomic policy changes that they make are consistent with uh, their long-term and structural policies that they plan to roll out. And these includes, you know, some of the regulatory tightening uh, that we have seen uh, last year. Um, obviously, one of the hot-button issue for China as well is trade, and specifically the U.S.-Chinese trade relationship, which has quite clearly uh, deteriorated over the past few months. Uh, what do you expect on uh, that front, and how much of a risk it is as, as you try and assess what's said for the Chinese economy. So I, I see the U.S. and China relationship as permanently changed. So the, you know, the strategic competition between the two countries is a long-term trend now. So this is not going to go away in the near term. And in fact, it's possibly likely to escalate in, in the near future. So we see that the deep bifurcation of global trade and technology remains a significant risk. Uh, which obviously are resulting from the U.S.-China trade tensions. And so from the Chinese perspective, the change in the U.S. administration from uh, Trump, President Trump to President Biden did not really lead to an easing of tensions. And on the contrary, tensions have in fact intensified, as you see you know, recently with some of the uh, uh, alliances that they make with Australia and the U.K., as well as um, uh, uh, some of the uh, Asian economies. So for, for us, trade issues will remain a major problem between the U.S. and China. And this is especially so when China has fell short of meeting its import uh, obligation under the phase one trade deal that they assigned uh, two years ago. So on top of all these trade issues, security issues will also be prominent between, you know, the two sides, the, the, the bilateral relationships, particularly, you know, anything relating to Taiwan and the South China Sea. Ruben, do you do you agree from a U.S. perspective? It, see, it really seems that those relations are are no time all time low, and really unlikely to improve. Yes, I fully agree. Uh, and we were expecting that the change of administration at the beginning of 2021 would not bring any significant improvement in uh, the U.S.-China relations, and that's what we saw. Um, we've recently seen that uh, that with the Olympics in Beijing. Um, that there are some diplomatic boycott going on. And it, it illustrates as well that 
that there are many fronts and and these and and these tensions are manifold. It's not only uh, competition in the in the in the tech sector. Um, it, it's also Taiwan. It's also um, mm -hmm. it's it's also human rights issues in in parts of China. Um, it's also Hong Kong. So it's uh, so so it's it, that's why. I don't see any significant improvement in terms of the rela the, 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 the relations between U.S. and China, and specifically on trade. Uh, there will be a little bit. There be, there might be some patience uh, with the Phase One agreement and China not meeting its target. Uh, but but soon enough, um, it will return on the table because um, it seems very unlikely that it will ever be able to reach um, what was agreed in at the beginning of 2020. Bernard, um, let me ask you about. Um what is going on in China in terms of doing business there? Uh, uh, we've had many discussions with many companies over the past few weeks and months at BFM Business to the effect that it's becoming more and more difficult to do business in China uh, because it's, dif it's more difficult to run your operations. Uh, it's more difficult to hire people. It's more difficult to have expatriates, uh, you know, getting on with whatever it is they have to do, doing their job on a daily basis. Um, uh, there's this push for uh, Chinese cons consumers to buy Chinese products, and you put all of this together, and it seems to make for a much more difficult environment for international companies to operate in China. Is that is that a fair summary, or is that an, exa an exaggeration? Well, I, I think that, you know, doing business in China has always been challenging, uh, especially for, for, for not, not just for foreign businesses, but also for the domestic company in China. Um, but, but having said that, you know, the, the business environment has changed quite a, a fair bit over the last year or two, uh, simply because of the, the, you know, changes in regulation, especially in certain sectors like, like technology, uh, specifically the platform industry as well as education and some other industry as well. So um, and and on so so when it comes to like hiring and all, all this is is getting more difficult also because China is pursuing a zero COVID policy, as I mentioned earlier. Um, so this has really been challenging for businesses because of the quarantine measures and some of the measures that they, they have to adhere to uh, and 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 so on. So um, but with all this aside, uh, China has stressed that they are still open to working with uh, uh, overseas companies. They are still welcoming investments into the, the, the country and so on. Uh, they have said that the external environment is becoming increasingly more complex and challenging for them. Uh, but nonetheless, they are still focusing there. They still remain open to the world for, for doing business over there. Okay. Uh, let's try and turn to Europe and see whether we have... Uh an assessment of, of evolving potential political or geopolitical risks as well. Obviously, here in France, we're going to have a presidential election in a few weeks, about 60 days now. Um, what do you expect from that in terms of risk profile for France? Um, well, um, all the latest polls indicate that President Macron will very likely be in the second round um, facing a right or far right wing candidate. Um, and that, in any case, he would uh, win whatever the configuration in the second round. Um, maybe the most entertaining scenario would be a, a second round between him and the right-wing candidate, Valérie Pécresse. But in any case, uh, the business environment and the economic environment would remain broadly unchanged. Um, another risk is that the future president fails to secure a majority in the legislative elections to be held in, in June. And it, it's but not a small risk. <laughs> Definitely. But we know that French are used to giving the newly elected president uh, a majority, as it was the case, for instance, in, in 2017. Yet, of course, with two months remaining before the presidential elections, twists and turns cannot be ruled out uh, in the final stretch of the campaign. Um, Boris Johnson doesn't seem to be in a very comfortable position at the moment. But the, the question I was going to ask is where it's been one year or so since Brexit. Um, is there anything we can say at this stage about whether, you know, Brexit has been a good or a bad thing for the British economy and whether it's likely to be a good or, or a bad thing over the next couple of years? Well, the economic impact of the Brexit was barely felt in, in 2021 because the implementation of border checks on imports from the EU were delayed twice. 
finally this year in January, some checks were finally imp implemented. And of course, it could have a negative impact on some companies that import from the, the EU, as it means more paperwork, uh, higher costs, amid, as we say here, uh, pressure on global supply chains. Um, but maybe regarding the, the UK-EU relationship, it's important, I think, to mention that despite the signing of the trade agreement, at the end there are still very important tensions between the EU, UK and the EU um, on Northern Ireland future status. Um, Jean-Christophe, at the beginning of this discussion, I've heard you say the word normalization. And we've been talking for about an hour and it uh, seems to me it's anything but normal. You know, there are so many uncertainties, so many complex issues we have to, to, to face. There are so many risks that you've been assessing and describing uh, over the past few minutes. Uh, what's normal about it? <laughs> Indeed, as we were saying, if all goes well, it, it might look paradoxical. But if all goes well, 2022 should be the year risks, I mean, non-health related risks are coming back. Mm. So normal so, is, is that risk is back to some extent. It is exactly that. Mm -hmm. I mean, especially uh, in this respect, yeah, yeah. Uh, the withdrawal of, of the government support measures, mm -hmm. especially in, in the context of tightening right. financial conditions, could, could prove to be damaging for companies. Quoi qu'il en coûte, whatever it costs mm -hmm. in, here in France. Exactly. Yes. So this should have an impact on, uh, on corporate insolvencies, which have basically disappeared from the radar over the last two years. So oh, well, that's interesting. Do you expect yeah. that to happen? Do you expect a, a, a wave of additional insolvencies because they've been hidden by the fact that governments were so supportive over the past few months? Indeed. We, we are used to, to talk about waves now. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> but I'm not sure we could talk about tsunami or waves in terms of insolvencies. Maybe. No, mm -hmm. I would not expect a tsunami in terms of insolvency levels, but, but I would expect a gradual okay. uh, increase mm -hmm. of the number of insolvencies in some sectors and in some countries. We observe already some developments here. Uh, I would have to say that uh, already energy traders, for example, are suffering in the context of the surge of energy prices. And uh, uh, the numbers of insolvencies are going up in a number of countries. UK, Spain are an example. But uh, it will all depend on how the uh, governments will decide to withdraw their support schemes and also how the banks will decide to support the uh, environment because in the end it's all a matter of liquidity in the market and it has been pretty abundant in the last period. Okay, okay, so not so bad after all. <laughs> it will be quite normal, I would say. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for, uh, for being with us today. It's been uh, quite enlightening uh, to discuss this country risk outlook. And that concludes our country risk conference for this year 2022 with COFAS and here with us at BFM Business. Thank you very much for being with us today.